Next Tuesday, we've got a session on digital safety, privacy, and surveillance, especially of phones and social media accounts. And one week from now, next Thursday, we've got a session on trauma and mental health. Please join us for all of these and help us spread the word. And if you have ideas about sessions, please get in touch. We're actually uh, working on several others um, as part of a longer series over the summer. So without further ado, I want to introduce to you my extraordinary colleague, Nora Benavides, the director of our US Free Expression Programs and a good friend of mine. Nora is a lawyer by training and before joining Penn, she worked as a civil and human rights litigator representing victims of unconstitutional police practices, First Amendment infringements, and voting rights violations. And she's too modest to say this, so I'm going to do it because she's still on mute. Uh, but she spent the last year pouring her soul into a report that actually looks at the ways in which, uh, in response to past protests and activism, local and state legislatures have been putting forth bills that are intended to curb protest rights moving forward. And this report came out a week before everything that's unfolded. It is extremely timely. And we are already seeing, and Nora might mention this, in response to some of the protests over the last several weeks, more of these bills cropping up. So it's a really critical read. Nora, I think it's Arresting Dissent, right, is the title. So check it out. And we'll, we'll be recording this session because there are a lot of folks who've emailed me to say they can't make it, but they really want to watch it and sharing it. And we can also share the report that I mentioned in that. So finally, some housekeeping. Um, we are going to have chat function open. We're going to have Q&A. If you folks have uh, Q questions, please go ahead and ask them in the Q&A. If you have thoughts you want to share, use the chat. Nora and I will both be keeping a close eye out on the Q&A uh, to, to flag questions as we go along. And so, Nora, I'm going to hand over to you. And I'm just going to go on mute um, so that I don't get in the way. Thanks, Victoria. It's so great to be here. And I have to say, it's while it is sobering times, I have felt so much solidarity and um, allyship with a lot of our colleagues, um, both the partner organizations that are working with us to produce and bootstrap from very little this wonderful series for all of you. And I see that we have, uh, it now looks like 85 participants. So I'm just really thrilled. And as much as we can, you know, I have to say virtual webinars are never ideal. Um, I wish we could be in person, but the benefit is that we are all together, probably from all over the country um, or elsewhere. Someone just said hi from Tokyo. So um, as much as we can have a little bit of, you know, conversation in the chat, I encourage it. I won't really be paying attention while I'm presenting, but I do hope that you'll really stay engaged. Um, you know, I'd love to begin. I'm gonna sh start sharing my screen. Um, so just give me one second. Um, host disabled attendee screen share. Let me just quickly then, Victoria, would you be willing to pull up the presentation and I can always just, you're on mute. I'm making you a co-host, co-host so you have total power. Total power. Total power. Uh, within reason, so let's see. Okay. It's great to be here with all of you for our Know Your Rights presentation. I wanna start with a roadmap for our discussion. We only have 90 minutes and I do wanna leave time for Q&A at the end. So what we'll begin with is really just a basic review of the legal principles associated with your rights in public places and on the job. Um, I'm sure many of you are somewhat familiar with this, but I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time um, to really go through these in detail. And so what we'll then do is pivot and talk through some of your First Amendment rights and really um, with the understanding that issues such as credentials, press areas, dispersal orders, how you record and when you can record police, all of the news gathering activities that you may be involved in right now, what your rights are under the First Amendment. And then frankly, we, we know that we are seeing a rise, a very severe rise, as Victoria said at the opening, um, in attacks on reporters and other members of the media. And so one of the things that we'll look at is what happens um, when police do in fact speak with you or when you have other types of encounters with police, including potentially violent attacks or arrests. And so we'll talk a little bit about what to do in the event that you do have a police encounter. 
And then we'll go through how you respond if your rights are somehow violated, including how to preserve your legal claims. Because one of the things I want you to leave with is a sense of, you know, frankly, knowing your rights will not prevent them from being violated. And in the disturbing and unfortunate circumstances where that may happen, I want you to feel empowered to know what recourse looks like and some of the requirements so that you can preserve your claims moving forward. So without further ado, I will um, jump right in. Um, you know, our partners at Freedom of the Press Foundation, CPJ, they have been doing a tremendous job of tracking incidents of reporters being targeted, harassed, um, tear gassed, you know, shot with rubber bullets, and then even arrested. And through some of that research, Freedom of the Press Foundation realized that of the 400 plus attacks on reporters or incidents generally, over 80% of those actually were at the hands of police, not protesters. And so I think that from the outset, there's really this need for us to understand how can we engage with police who are an unavoidable aspect of these protests? And then what are your rights and ways to move forward if something happens? And so I, you know, I want to begin with um, kind of the basics. And unfortunately, people often say, well, what special rights do reporters have, um, you know, under the Constitution? And the answer is that journalists' rights are the same as civilian rights, that reporters actually do not have some special carve out under the First Amendment that grants them more rights. And it's really important to understand that, that there are absolutely ways that you can try to safeguard some of your rights and to preserve your ability to record police, to continue reporting on the protests, but that there's no carve out within the First Amendment. But within the First Amendment, there are key principles for you to be able to understand. And over and over again, our courts have affirmed various aspects of what journalists often do, which is be in public places and record police. You know, I will say the First Amendment um, is really meant to safeguard five fundamental rights. And you probably know many of these, but those are speech, assembly, religion, press, and petition to the government um, for redress of grievances, which is an interesting aspect. It really provides an avenue for you to be able to ask the government for relief in the event of grievances. And so it's kind of a reflexive First Amendment right within the First Amendment. Um, your strongest rights are going to be in public forums. That's really the place where people are out and they're marching, they are demonstrating, they are sidewalks, um, streets, parks. There are other ways then that the government may impose regulations on how people exercise their speech. But that can only be based on certain things, which are often called time, place, or manner of the speech, which means there really cannot be limits on what protesters or journalists are doing if it involves the content of what they're saying. You know, someone cannot be arrested, for example, on the basis of what a sign says. But there are some reasonable regulations that the government, for example, can put in place. You may need a permit in order to use a sound amplifier during a protest. And so these regulations have to be very narrowly tailored and they have to be things that ultimately enhance public safety. And what's so, I would say, sobering at this point is that when you think back to the origins of the First Amendment, when I do, you know, I've been litigating cases representing protesters and journalists for years. You know, the First Amendment is there to protect people who are demonstrating and police should ostensibly be there to help allow protests to happen which means they should not be getting in the way of protesters or reporters. And yet, unfortunately, over and over again, we have seen that. We have seen that from the Occupy Wall Street protests. We've seen that from 2014, 2015, 2016, when Black Lives Matter protesters took to highways, as well as other public forums. Um, and we've seen it here again. We've even seen it in contexts where there are border agents in uh, border areas. And so it's really kind of, I think, a sobering aspect when I do these trainings. And I've been doing them now since, I think, 2014. I, I think it's just sort of the, the conundrum that we're in that I always feel that the ultimate recommendation is to say, know your rights, but then know how to pivot quickly in the event that your rights are violated. So 
you know, if there are instances in which people are demonstrating in things in areas that are not public forums, there may be limitations then, and there may be reasonable regulations that the government can impose. But generally, if you as a reporter or a member of the media are attending and observing or covering a protest that's in one of those public forums, which is on a street, sidewalk, in a park, in a public plaza, reporters do not need to do certain things. And I want to be able to lay those out for you so that you feel comfortable. One, reporters don't need credentials to cover protests. Um, and we are seeing a rise in attacks on citizen journalists, for sure. Generally, reporters enjoy a right of access just the way the public does. You also do not need permission to be at these protests. You don't even need to have permission of any kind to be able to engage in news gathering activities. And so often one of the very first tiers of engagement with police are if they question why you might be there. And so those are the types of instances where I generally recommend that you maintain a level of civility, that you answer questions, but that there is no need to get permission from officers for being in one of those public places or for covering protests. Um, there are a few things that credentials though can give you. And I wanna be really cautious in how I, I talk to you about that. They, one, they don't shield you though from arrest if you do engage in unlawful conduct, um, which is a double-edged sword, I would say. And part of what we are very careful about is walking people through the ways that you may engage in unlawful conduct and then not actually realize it. A great example is when officers try to um, essentially move protests from maybe one side of a street to another. And while they are doing that, they will encourage people to cross the street. And I've seen multiple times arrests happen where people, whether they're reporters, citizen journalists, or protesters, they comply with an officer's request to cross the street, and then they are arrested for obstructing traffic. This is a very low level offense, but ultimately it's a way to just limit crowds and reduce them. And so, for example, if you have credentials, you know, think very carefully about how you are complying with officer orders. Because on the one hand, they can't shield you from unlawful conduct, like if you were to be blocking or obstructing traffic. At the same time, they are often thought actually to allow you to cross police lines. And so if you are in one of these instances where you have the opportunity or officers are asking you to cross or to be, you know, to move somewhere while you're covering a protest, I would be very clear in the way that you ask. Say, I wanted to be clear that I am asking to cross the police lines here and that that's lawful. Those are things that honestly just ensure that you are doing everything you can to one, comply with their orders and at the same time, not have to relinquish your own First Amendment rights. In terms of press areas, these are often areas that are um, cordoned off for members of the media. And on the one hand, they have, I think, historically been thought of as you know, a way to protect reporters. We know that that is the case at large campaign rallies or otherwise. But in the same breath, they can be used to limit your coverage. And so it's an area of potential abuse by law enforcement agencies. If what they are doing is seeking to create or encourage and move in a shepherding way reporters to press areas to restrict their ability to cover certain areas of the protest. And so one, I would say, if you are covering a protest, think back to that first slide and know that if that is in a public forum, you are able to be there. That is your protected right and you can be covering the protest without fear of arrest or anything else. Now, remember, knowing this may be different from what officers do do, but it is absolutely protected speech and for your activity to be there covering a protest in a public place, even if there is a separate press area. And so I want you to feel really comfortable with that. I'll move to the next slide. I wanna talk a little bit about filming. I think that it's one of the most um, crucial things we are watching now in the rack up of incidents against reporters. Um, first of all, filming is a protected activity. Um, you can film anything in plain view, and you can certainly film police conducting their activities. Um, and so one of the questions that I often get are, what happens if an officer asks that I stop recording? And you don't need to stop recording, though there may be unlawful consequences on their end, which can help further potential affirmative uh, litigation on your end. But if you are filming something, 
that is a protected activity that is protected under the First Amendment. And generally the sense is if you're recording, keep recording. Keep recording for numerous reasons. One, because it creates a record, you know, and if in the end you feel like your rights have been violated, you want that video. You want to not only keep recording, but if in the end you feel like you're going to have an encounter with police, try then to leave your camera somewhere. And I know we've seen instances of this, of reporters leaving their cameras on the floor so that the camera can continue recording their encounters with police. When you are lawfully present in a public space, and I keep coming back to this to hopefully just reiterate over and over again those rights, you have the right to photograph anything in plain view as well as then record. And so as long as you're not interfering with an officer, you can do that. Officers also cannot confiscate or demand to view your photographs or your video without a warrant. And so there, within this, there are a few things that you may want to be careful about. One is, if they are asking to see your recordings, it might be on your phone. And you can always refuse to unlock your phone because in many ways that can be seen as testimonial if you're unlocking your device and giving them a password or something. And so they may not demand to do that. And you may comfortably say that is within your First Amendment rights to not relinquish the contents of your photographs or your video. And if they want a warrant, great. Police officers cannot, in addition, delete any data under any circumstances. And really this would come into play if you were to be arrested and for your, um, the contents of your devices to be searched. So I do wanna point out a couple of cases that might help. Um, primarily, there is a really critical 2011 case, Glick versus Conniff. And that was the seminal case that found that you can record officers in the normal course of their activities. They, uh, there were three officers in 2011 that arrested a teenager and another person filmed that. Um, ultimately, the guy that filmed it, Glick, was charged with various criminal statutes. And he took his case all the way up then to the First Circuit. And the First Circuit really um, ruled very positively, affirming that filming is a protected First Amendment activity. I wanna talk a little bit about police, the role of police and, and dispersal orders because um, in an ideal world, officers would be on hand to allow a protest to happen. And unfortunately, what we are seeing is uh, quite the opposite. I know Victoria briefly mentioned this report that we've authored at PEN America, and I will just highlight a couple of things. We're seeing a, a similar trend right now in the George Floyd and solidarity protests around the country that we've seen in other instances in which officers um, really cast protesters and others on site as criminal, that there is an inherently criminal aspect to gathering. And even reporters there or legal observers should not be, that they should not be observing or engaging in the news gathering activities there at protests. And so part of what we're working on from at least a narrative perspective is breaking down that misconception, which is really tied to the First Amendment, that ultimately our freedom to assemble and our freedom to associate and reporters' ability to gather information really be the eyes and ears of the public, as some of our Supreme Court justices have said, that that is protected speech, that is protected activity, and it is not criminal. If individuals in the course of a protest cross let's say a highway, there are already existing criminal statutes, whether they are misdemeanors or felonies that can be used against people. And unfortunately, what we are seeing is this rise in legislators introducing proposals to try to actually create bigger and harsher penalties for people who are actually usually engaging in protected speech or are engaging in speech that might already come with some criminal penalty. And so when we think about the role of reporters in all of this, part of what reporters can do, one, is push back on the narrative that what protesters are doing is criminal. The other is be able to be there on hand to cover and report what is happening. And over and over again, what we've seen is that, one, reporters are being targeted. You know, we've seen over 400 incidents. Again, nearly 80% of those have been at the hands of police. And even legal observers who are usually third party, 
individuals with some training to be able to observe protests have also started getting arrested, which really begs the question of why and who does this benefit to sweep up reporters, even legal observers. And I think some of it comes back to that there is that narrative that is being crafted around these protests. It's happened before in other mass demonstrations and social movement settings. And so one of the things that we have to remember is what the role of law enforcement should be, that it should not be to crack down or make arrests or limit protests, but to really ensure that protests are allowed to happen. So one of the tactics that is used uh, by law enforcement agencies when they want to try to shut down a protest is that they issue a dispersal order. But I have to say, the dispersal order should be an officer's and be an agency's last resort. So police may not break up a gathering unless there is clear and present danger of riot, unlawful activity, interference with existing traffic, or other immediate threat to public safety. And I can say that again, but I just want it to be very clear that there are instances in which an officer and police together may break up or try to issue a dispersal order. And that can be an absolutely lawful order. But very often the orders are not in response to what is a clear and present danger of riot or unlawful activity. The one caveat is think about traffic, because I think that over and over again, uh, traffic is used as sort of the vehicle, if you will, no pun intended, to be able to target and sweep up protesters and reporters. And so in the middle of this, it's really important to be conscientious of the misdemeanors that come with obstructing traffic because it can be seen as potentially the pretext for officers to issue a dispersal order and then make arrests. And so the thing that I have here on the slide to keep in mind is that there must be some reasonable opportunity for people to comply with the dispersal order after it has been given. It cannot be used as a tactic, for example, to stop reporters from filming. And we know that that has happened. We've seen officers try to use these orders to arrest the press, to detain them, and then usually to stop them from recording or reporting on things. And so I would, one, be very cautious about resisting officers in those moments. I would absolutely always highlight this opportunity for compliance. And if you hear a dispersal order and that that is mandated right now, there must be time for you to comply with it as both a protester and as a reporter. Um, there must be, and I'll break down what that opportunity for compliance means, it means that there must be a clear and detailed notice of the dispersal order, including how much time you have to disperse. And so you have to be able to have heard something about where to go and how long you have. Often that means there may be directives, both physical or verbal, Sometimes neither is the unfortunate truth, but that there must be directives about what exit routes you can follow. Because ultimately, if you are arrested for, let's say, unlawful assembly of some kind, um, that is another increased penalty we've noticed uh, from PEN America's research on these new legislative proposals. And so if you are arrested for things like that, those are instances in which you may very well want to record what is happening so that you can later consider all of the myriad ways to preserve your legal claims and potentially take further action. So unfortunately, I think that um, I go back to what I started with, you know, knowing your rights will not prevent them from being violated. If we are looking in only the last three weeks at over 400 incidents of reporters and other members of the media being targeted, most of which is by police, I think it is unreasonable for me to be here as a legal expert to say, it won't matter. When you go cover a protest, you'll be fine. I think you need to, in every instance, be ready for encounters with police, whether they are physical encounters, questions from officers, or potentially being detained. The one thing to remember is that legally, police cannot detain you without reasonable suspicion that you are about to commit a crime, that you have committed a crime, or you're in the process of doing so. And so part of that dynamic when, let's say, an officer gives an order and you comply, and in the middle of compliance, you technically then commit another misdemeanor like obstructing traffic, those are no-win, those are lose-lose situations. And they are incredibly, I think, dirty tactics that police use to try to um, contain and even reduce protest size, not to mention limit the ability of reporters to actually cover this. 
But if we're talking generally about what officers can and can't do, I do want to make sure everyone is clear. The Fourth Amendment controls here to the extent that the Constitution and within that the Fourth Amendment is really the primary protector of everything that the government can't do to intrude on you. So all of the ways that government may try and that police may try to limit what you are doing, to seize your devices or your news gathering materials, the Fourth Amendment controls here. And so everything that flows from this, if we're thinking about our Bill of Rights almost for reporters, it's really crucial to know that you are protected by the First Amendment in your ability to be somewhere, to be recording police and to be reporting, to be the eyes and ears of people. And then you are protected by the Fourth Amendment in various ways. If there is an interaction with police, I think um, I have to admit, you know, I've had that. And over the years in working with protesters, I, I do think it gets lost that it can be incredibly stressful when you are questioned or even detained by officers. And so as much as you can, one, I always reiterate to stay calm. You know, make sure your hands are also visible. And these may seem perfunctory or simple recommendations, but they are critical in helping to de-escalate encounters with police. To, the, to limit also the likelihood of arrest or injury, part of what you wanna make sure is that if you are speaking to an officer, if they approach you, that in no way do you seem like you are obstructing or resisting their encounter. And so, you know, if they try to hold you, one of the best questions you can always ask is, am I free to go? Am I under arrest? Because they cannot detain you without reasonable suspicion. So if you are stopped though, I wanna talk a little bit about what that means. One, you always wanna ask if you are free to go. Let's see. Also, you do not have to show ID necessarily when an officer asks. Um, one of the most stressful aspects, I think, of talking with officers is feeling like you must give consent for various things. So, you know, at most you can give your name, you can give your address maybe, or your age, but there's very little that you have to relinquish other than that. You also do not have to consent to a search of your person or your belongings. There are things that officers can do. They can pat you down. Um, they can also search you if they end up arresting you. But one of my recommendations here is that if you get to that point where you are having to say you do not consent to a search of your devices, maybe of your notes that you're taking, I would highly recommend that you keep filming that. That if you can, either you film it or you have a witness and a buddy that continues filming that encounter. Um, if the police ask to search you, what can you say? You can say, I do not consent to the search. Simple. Um, you can even ask, are you wanting to search me? I do not consent. Because so often the tactics that, that police use in trying to get you to give implied consent are really to move around your ability to know, oh, I just gave consent. And so again, it really comes down to these tactics that are very um, nimble on the part of police. And I would not fall prey to those. Uh, I'll, I'll just say something about the trends that we're seeing because I think it, you know, I was doing some research looking in preparation for today on what we're seeing now with these over 400 incidents um, and dozens and dozens and dozens of arrests of reporters and what did it look like in previous years. And I know that during Occupy, dozens of reporters were arrested. Um, and in the last few weeks, given the number of incidents, we've been deeply troubled by what this does to potential citizen journalists and journalists without outlets that they belong to, as well as others. Um, and it should not be the case that we are in a situation here where we are doing this presentation is the unfortunate circumstance. Um, but we are where we are. And so part of what we want to be able to do is give you a set of very clear directives where these are things you can implement easily. These are things that if you already feel a sense of comfort about your First Amendment rights, and you feel a sense of comfort, comfort about being able to speak to police and confirm the various ways that maybe you are not being detained or that you do not give consent, we wanna be able to empower you to do that. Unfortunately, I think these, um, as one judge recently said, officers make split second decisions. 
And what that means is in an instant, they may decide to take any number of actions, whether that is assaulting reporters or others, whether it is making orders that might be unreasonable or potentially making an arrest or a detainment. And so if that happens, I think it's in really important to then be able to know what to do next. Because in that moment, if you were to be detained or especially if you were to be arrested, it's incredibly stressful, you know? Um, adrenaline is very high. I would say you have intense emotions as well as uh, other reactions. And so there are a set of kind of best practices that I wanna go through with you. So one, if you do get arrested, you have the right to remain silent. And one of the most important aspects is asking, am I under arrest? Because if you are, if you are not, I'm sorry, a certain set of activities and behavior on your part can flow. But if an officer confirms that you are under arrest, another set of activities and concerns must now flow out of that. And so I wanna start by saying, if you have digital documentation, let's say you have documentation of any sort regarding the affiliate that you work for, the network, the outlet, if you're also a freelancer, I don't know if you'll have ID, but a lot of times we as protesters, as even people just coming out to observe, you may not bring a whole lot. And if you only have digital documentation on your phone, your phone will be taken if you get arrested, which means you will not have access to any of that documentation when you are separated from it. And so unfortunately, you need to be armed and ready for this by having supplemental ID in some form. And I would recommend thinking about a few different options. One would be your credentials, perhaps. Admittedly, credentials have been used in the past to actually specifically target reporters. But I would say if you can, keep something on you. It might be a press pass of some sort or credential. It could be a physical ID, uh, a driver's license or another form of ID even a business card that identifies you as a journalist. And again, if you're having an encounter where it seems like you are being arrested, keep recording. The other thing you do not have to do is reveal your immigration status. I wish we had more time to go through some of the ways that other agencies like CBP and Border Patrol have been at with heavy presence some of these protests that we've seen closer to our borders. And it implicates a whole different set of legal questions. And so perhaps that's something we can do down the line if you all are interested. But there, in the meantime, at least, I wanted to give just a, a small tip that you do not have to reveal your immigration status to the police if you are under arrest. The other thing to keep in mind is, you know, it all happens very, very quickly. So one of the things you want to try to do is identify who is arresting you. Are you being arrested by a certain local agency? Are you being arrested by state government um, department? Even if you can get the officer's name or badge number, these are critical things for you when it comes to later issues that you'll be thinking about. There's a lot. All right, if you do get arrested, what else then? Well, one, you have the right to talk to an attorney. And if you do get arrested, the officer should ideally stop questioning you. But if they continue, there are a few things that you can state. One, you can say, I'm going to remain silent. I want to speak to a lawyer. The issue then becomes, do you have a lawyer to call? You know, you are allowed to remain silent. That does not include booking questions. And if you can only make one call, I would honestly say it depends on your situation. It depends on how much prep you have put into what your um, set of tools are. So if you have no access to your phone, one of the recommendations I always give is to write the name of your best first contact, basically the phone call you would want to make on your arm. It could be your editor, perhaps, if you work for an outlet, and there may be legal counsel there. It also could be a private colleague, a witness, a friend that also works with you that will on your behalf then help call others if you are arrested. If you don't have lawyers that you know to call, there are other places that we can provide resources for you. The Reporters Committee obviously has their hotline, and so that's a really good one for you. They are always available 24-7 to answer calls. And there are other local places, local legal groups that um, are often available. So I just want to flag some of the 
it almost sounds silly, but it's, it's the logistics of if you do get arrested, we don't think very often about all the things we'll be losing. And when you don't have your phone, I'm not sure about you, but I don't have very many phone numbers memorized. And so you want to make sure to write that down, literally have it on your arm. Now, what about preserving your legal claims? Um, this is where it gets interesting and I would say almost fun. Um, I spent before coming to PEN America, um, the better part of several years, uh, six years working on affirmative constitutional litigation, uh, both at the ACLU and in private practice. And so I think that some of what happens in the wake of getting arrested is really critical for you to be aware of. Because what you want to do is be in the best possible position to move forward in any number of ways that you want to. And so the first thing that I always recommend is, of course, write everything down. You know, you may forget things in a week or even two days. And so if you do get arrested, you want to make sure that what you do is catalog or memorialize all of the things that happened to you. That might include a few number of things. It could include if you remember the officer's name that made the arrest. Even if you remember some of the badge numbers or officers that were in the booking phase for you, if you remember the agency that arrested you, all of that, you want to write it down. If you had any injuries, you want to take photos of that. Even if you had clothes that um, were part of, let's say, injury or damage, uh, you want to be able to save those for later on if you were pursuing affirmative litigation. The other thing you want to do is get information from witnesses. You want to get their names, their contact info, video recordings perhaps of what they filmed, their account of everything. And I would say that in the context of reporters and members of the media, you know, you so often will work in teams or be encouraged to during these protests so that there is someone who knows generally where you are. Maybe they have the phone number as well for a lawyer if one of you gets arrested. They may also then be charged with, for you, filming everything. You want to have that accountability with someone in the field. Um, if you don't have that, and if later you find that it's really hard to get witnesses, you may go back through your recordings, the things that perhaps you already filmed police and others, and try to identify people. It can be incredibly hard, but it can eventually make the difference between um, having witnesses in your case, um, having a strong case where officers are not able to refute the, your claims, especially if there is no footage of what an encounter with an officer was like. It's really important to try to find witnesses who can give an accounting. The other thing to, uh, in the early days is you may consider filing some kind of internal complaint. That can be with a police affairs board. Uh, you know, many of these have entities like that. You can also ask for a police incident report, but I would generally say um, once you start getting into this territory, you may want to consult with an attorney. And so there is some pro bono counsel, for example, that can help you. Um, I know the Reporters Committee is working on local counsel around the country in various places and jurisdictions to help reporters um, with some of these types of questions. Basically, the earlier you can consult with someone, an attorney, about the range of um, possibilities for you is the better. And really, it comes down to being able to go through what actually happened. Because, you know, I gave you some basics about your First Amendment rights, your Fourth Amendment rights, that, for example, you can be in a public place, you can film police, you can uh, be there news gathering about protests, and yet, to be honest, that won't prevent your rights from being violated. And so if in the in, in, uh, event that that does happen, part of what you want to be able to do is think about, were my First Amendment rights violated? Were my Fourth Amendment rights violated? Oftentimes, they go hand in hand. And that if you are, let's say, filming a protest and you are targeted with rubber bullets, we've heard this on countless occasions now in the last several weeks, reporters being uh, shot with rubber bullets or tear gassed, basically preventing them from doing their essential news gathering, that is a violation of their First Amendment rights. At the same time, if it results, let's say, in officers doing a sweep and arresting people, that may then be an unlawful arrest. And it will be something that you can challenge additionally. 
And so you'll want to have an attorney to be able to talk with you about these different avenues if your First Amendment rights were violated, if your Fourth Amendment rights. Which brings me to number four, which is um, there is something called anti litem notice. It is um, not very fun, but it is critical if you want to pursue constitutional claims in the future. The way that you would be doing that is through federal statute. It is um, Section 1983 litigation. That was the thrust of what I did when I uh, was a practicing and litigating attorney, is represent people in Section 1983 cases. These are instances where you bring a case um, alleging constitutional violations at the hands of government agents. And so that can allow you to, let's say, sue government officials. It's only in civil court, but it's for the deprivation of your civil and constitutional rights. So you, as a member of the media, would be the plaintiff. The officer involved in, let's say, either um, arresting you or taking your um, news gathering materials or otherwise targeting you, they would be the defendant. And what you would be doing is claiming that by unlawfully interfering with your news gathering, the police violated your First Amendment rights. Well, the problem is that there are so many barriers to even bringing these types of claims. And in the middle of getting arrested, in the middle of memorializing everything, of taking photos of your injuries, of actually then trying to get back into the field and report, you know, you may want to file your complaint, you may want to then ask for a police incident report. And in the middle of all of it, there are these deadlines in various jurisdictions in which governments mandate anti litem notice be served on the government entities, which is your intent to sue them. If you do not file that, you will not be able to file your 1983 litigation. And so I always bring that up in the context of these types of trainings, because if we're coming full circle, one, it's really incredibly difficult to mount a successful 1983 case, but they are one of the last stop gaps actually in holding officers and government agents accountable for your constitutional violations. And so I want you to feel at least, at the very least, empowered to be able to know that if you are out there reporting, one, that is protected speech. If you are filming police, if you're filming protesters, that is protected speech. All of what is in plain view, you can be doing. And if officers stop you, you have absolutely the right to ask if you're being detained. You have the right to ask, am I under arrest? If you are under arrest, you have the ability then to say, I want to remain silent and I would like to speak to a lawyer. And frankly, throughout that entire process, there are always entry points where a constitutional violation may occur. And so in that spectrum, that very long experience, some of the ways that you can then hold officers accountable is through litigation like this. I want to um, save enough time for questions and I'm sensitive to time because I feel like I'm seeing that there are um, many like chat and, and Q&A. So I do want to start wrapping it up um, on my end, at least. One of the things that we're really excited about is that this is only the first in um, a series that we are working, as you can see, with a wonderful set of partners, uh, the International Women's Media Foundation, the Committee to Protect Journalists, Freedom of the Press Foundation, DART Center. Um, and in coordination, we are some form of us, whether it's me or Victoria or other colleagues of ours, we are conducting these trainings now over the next week or so. And if there is further interest, we are happy to continue doing more of these. Um, the next one that we'll be kicking off is actually tomorrow. It'll be at 11 a.m. And that is a physical safety training. Really, um, you know, in the middle of all of the legal stuff, I tried to refrain from saying too much about your physical safety, really just giving you the very basic essentials of what you should know on your rights and making sure that those core First and Fourth Amendment issues are something that we're conveying to you. Then we're going to be moving towards doing a digital safety, surveillance, and privacy training, really about your security, to keep your things safe, your devices and otherwise, maybe to help you um, understand how to communicate with others. And then finally, we're going to be doing a mental health session, which will be working on um, talking about how to manage threat and manage trauma. Because so many of the reporters that I have spoken with, whether they're actually covering these protests or know others who are, have found this just incredibly exhausting, is the truth. 
Um, and so we want to make sure that we're triaging as much as we can, giving you a range of tools and resources. So I encourage you to um, ask questions in the Q&A. I also want to point out that you can make yourself anonymous in the Q&A chat. So if you don't want your name to show up, you can. Um, as Victoria had said, we're, we're going to open this up for uh, we're recording this session so that what we'll be able to do is broadcast it again. But if in the meantime you have questions, you can always reach out to us. So I'll pause there. We at least have uh, 20, 25 minutes, I think, for questions. So I'm, I'm happy to take them. Generally, what I do is I stop sharing my screen and I look at the Q&A. Nora, I can also flag there have been a lot of questions um, coming up. So they're, they're mixed between the chat and the Q&A. So let me direct your attention. I, I think it would be fair if we sort of started with some of the questions that were posed some time ago. Folks have been very patiently waiting. Um, and uh, so I think Molly Hennessy Fisk has several questions. Um, and if you keep kind of scrolling down from there, you'll see more. I'll let you tackle them and I'll go back on mute. But if you need me, let me know. Sure. Um, oh, I see. Okay, wonderful. Um, so we have a question about curfews. Um, and I'm going to read this aloud. I'll keep all of these anonymous, though, just so you all know, though I realize anyone can read these. <laughs> what about curfews? We were covering a Minnesota protest uh, where police fired at us and um, the press were subject to the curfew. So typically media should be exempted from the curfews. Um, one of the things that I know the reporters committee has been doing is gathering a really tremendous rack up of all of the curfew orders around the country, most of which are local, though there are some state orders. And we are identifying where those curfews do not include media because they should. Um, there are reasonable, like fr from a constitutional perspective, if we're looking at civilians, I will say that curfews are, um, it really kind of depends on whether it's easy to mount a constitutional challenge on those. The easiest is if they do not exempt media from the curfew, because they should. But a lot of the challenges we're seeing are hit or miss, where some cities, based on the reasonable restrictions local agencies impose, are actually going to pass constitutional muster, and then others are not. It really depends on the reasonableness, really like what time is the curfew, um, if it's been challenged in a really strong legal way, and where media are concerned though, you absolutely should be exempt. And so I'll, I'll just say one final thing about this, that just today, um, well, it was late last night, we sent letters with our partners from CPJ along with 56 other organizations to every governor around the country, notifying them of instances in their state where the curfews enacted do not exempt media. And part of what we're doing is hoping that we can have an ongoing discussion to put pressure on these governors to exempt media from that. So we're monitoring it. If you have anecdotes or stories that you're willing to come forward with, that would be tremendous because we are keeping a constant log of all of these. Um, another question is, a number of us media have been injured. Minnesota State Patrol has yet to apologize or respond to questions about whether they are investigating. Um, well, I would say, one, the injury has already occurred. So if you're looking at all of the ways you can prepare for a potential constitutional violation, that's already happened, right, in this instance. So if you've been injured, you want to then be in the posture of memorializing, documenting, trying to get other people who may have been witnesses to come forward and talk with you and memorialize their memory of what actually happened. And then you want to get on, I think, the proactive and affirmative path of talking with lawyers. What type of position are you in where you can potentially look at constitutional claims? Um, I think in Minnesota, you know, Governor Waltz has been relatively strong in uh, responding to some of what has been happening. But I have to say there have been at least over 65, maybe 66 incidents of reporters being targeted. And so it is, uh, it's, it's shocking. And um, I anticipate there will be much, much, much litigation to come. Someone just noted that they had to leave and I wanna remind everyone this is being recorded. So if you wanna come back, that's great. You can always revisit this. 
Um, officers told us to disperse and said, move. Is that enough? Are they supposed to give us more specific directions? And if they don't, what would you recommend we do? That's a great question. Um, and it's kind of gray. Technically, dispersal orders should be given with clear direction that provides at least some time for you to respond and comply and or what your exit path can be. And so I, I mentioned briefly, you know, if we were in person, I could kind of show you physically, but oftentimes dispersal orders will include officers creating lines of obstruction where people cannot go in certain directions. And they will then do what you've said where they just say move. And so what you want to do is one, you want your hands visible. You want to maintain a kind of civility and calm and say, where would you like us to move? If they are dispersing and they don't give you any more information, are you following the crowd? I think it is well within your rights to be able to ask for more clarification. Say, we're complying, where do you want us to go? Because dispersal orders must include something so that you know how to comply and within what time frame. You cannot comply immediately. If you are in a massive crowd, even if you are a reporter and there is a dispersal order, no one can comply automatically. And so that means that there has to be that reasonable period for compliance. And it really comes down to trying to maintain a level of just civility, asking direct questions, where would you like us to go? You know, some of what I've witnessed in, I'm in Brooklyn and I've been watching some of these protests and um, I was over near Barclays recently and I, you know, I observed people being really antagonistic to police, which emotionally I totally understand. But legally, that does not help. And so especially for press, if you are trying to ascertain what to do, where to go, those are very simple questions that I would just encourage you to have a list of how you want to ask questions of officers. Okay, a question about what rights do I have as a freelance video journalist to pursue legal action against an officer who fired his weapon at me, point blank, while announcing I was, well, this person was announcing I was press with press credits visible, wielding a camera, rig. What else can be said that will make an officer desist from targeting the media during protests? Excellent question. Um, well, one, I would say, please write to me. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Attorney Nora, or you can email me and I'll put my email in the chat. Um, it is nbenavidez at pen.org. Um, we will happily put you in touch with attorneys. We are working with a set of pro bono attorneys, as I know my colleagues at CPJR as well. Because if you're looking at what your rights are, it sounds like they are at least somewhat strong. And part of what has to happen with every case consideration is just the range of facts um, and that every case is different. But if you are in an area where there is a public crowd, right, you are there lawfully. If you are then engaging in filming what is in public view or plain view, that is still protected under the First Amendment. And so if you have been targeted, like this person who says, you know, rubber bullets were fired at me point blank while I was saying that I was press, that is a First Amendment violation, or at least it sounds like it. In terms of what else can be said that will make an officer desist, I often feel uh, like I'm truly in a sobering and, and even like heartbreaking situation where I work with um, whether it's former clients that I know, whether it's protesters or members of the media. And I don't have an answer for that. I think that that is a much larger question about the systemic issues around training police. I know some of my amazing colleagues are working on ways to train police on different de-escalation tactics, because this is the very type of encounter that troubles me. And I know legally it really implicates very serious constitutional questions. Um, you know, sometimes people recommend that you wear some identifiable thing, whether it's a hat or a vest that says press. I feel really uh, reticent to give that as a recommendation, frankly, because I think that what we're seeing lately, when we see over 400 incidents of reporters being targeted, over 80% of those at the hands of officers, I don't feel comfortable giving you something that makes it easier to identify that you're a member of the media. In the end, what I think this does is puts a target on your back. And so there is no simple answer here. And that's part of why, frankly, knowing your rights and then knowing what to do if they get violated is really kind of the, the, the secret sauce. Let's see. 
can you list the types of answers we should provide legally aside from our name? If an officer asks questions about why you're there, um, you know, one, you want to give as little as possible, of course, uh, in terms of information. You can give your name. You can also give um, your age and your address. And one of the things I've noted, at least in New York, for example, is that legislators have just introduced a new bill to criminalize rioters who come from out of state. One of the things we've seen in this recent round of protests and demonstrations is that people from out of state come to protest. And so I'm, again, reticent to say there is a surefire or, or silver bullet answer. But if you are talking with police, you can say that you are a member of the media. You can say that you are here legally. You can also say, if you want, where your address is, especially if it's local, because that may help. That it's not a surefire answer, but these are things that typically help minimize encounters and de-escalate encounters with police. If it seems like there is an encounter that is perhaps escalating, I would honestly point you then to what the recommendation is from the beginning, which is film and keep filming. And if you think you are going to have some physical encounter, make sure your hands are visible. Um, often the one of the tactics used when it isn't tear gas or rubber bullets is that people get thrown to the ground and so their cameras drop because they're holding something in their hand, whether it's an iPhone, you know, it's a cell phone or an actual uh, camera. And when that falls, often filming cuts off. And so it really is, uh, it sort of behooves you to be able to have something recorded and then set it down and have your hands free. And if it ends up being, you know, that you end up just having this recording, great. If it escalates, it's really good to have that on film. Let's see. Um, I just got a good note that someone's interested in the border angle. And so I'm happy to provide that. We do trainings regularly for reporters around issues of um, safety and legal questions at the border because your rights are very different when you're dealing with customs and border um, or border patrol. They are very, very different. Um, so no, right. great. You can also make sure to take a look at the Q&A. There are some folks who've been very patiently. I asked everyone to try to use the oh, Q&A. Sure. So I want to make sure some of those folks get their questions. I see a question that's in both of these, um, which is what is the typical deadline for anti litem Are we talking days or hours? Well, the great news is usually it's about a year. Um, the problem is that you may forget. And so that's why uh, in no uncertain terms, I always encourage people to talk with an attorney because the anti litem notice is really critical. It does vary though. And, um, and so I don't want to give that answer that every state has that, um, but many do. And they have a, basically it's a 12 month period. Um, I'm going to move over to the Q&A because we have a lot. We have 15 questions. Um, someone has asked, what is a citizen journalist? Um, well, a citizen journalist might be someone that is, let's say in the protest context, they are on hand and they are covering the protests, but they do not have any affiliation. They are doing this um, because they perhaps have not been trained or considered what is a more formal definition of journalist belonging to or working for an outlet. And so I will say I've seen from colleagues uh, around the country, several have said they know citizen journalists that have been arrested. Those numbers aren't even included in many of the tallies that we've seen. Um, and so there really does seem to be a concerted effort on the part of police to limit coverage, limit filming, limit reporter presence during these protests. If officers demand that a reporter back away from an arrest in progress, making it impossible for the reporter to record that arrest, how should the reporter respond? What if they threaten arrest? Well, that implicates a lot of things. Um, one, you cannot interfere with an officer um, that may be conducting an arrest or if they are, if you are somehow interfering with their police activity. So a couple of things here is one, if you're filming, I think it one is worth noting, are you actually interfering with their ability to conduct the arrest? Because maybe that is a tactic that is being used by police to um, legitimize their asking you to move away because they don't want it on film. You absolutely have the right to record though an officer making an arrest. The only question is that nuance of whether you are interfering in their activity. And so if you can be somehow far enough to record, I would say try to, try to do that. Um, they should not be threatening arrest if you are somehow able to be far enough that they can 
actually conduct the arrest because you have absolutely a First Amendment right to record that. At the same time, I think it becomes a judgment call. And much of what I do when I work with either potential clients, when I talk with reporters, even protesters, is really learn your own litmus test of where the line is. You know, do you feel like it is worth getting arrested to have that on camera? That is a question that I cannot answer. And I think for each of us, the answer would be different. How far are you willing to go to be able to have documentation of potential police misconduct or constitutional violations? And so I would always caution you that if you want to be recording something, do whatever you can to actually safeguard against getting arrested. Because the truth is it, it's costly. It's then on your record. Um, so many of the charges against people uh, over the years, the last several years for mass protests, I've actually noticed they have been dropped, but there is no assurance that that will happen. And so if you're really on the cusp of some kind of encounter with a police officer, I would encourage you to err on the side of caution and think twice. At the same time, um, that is only because I think there is a whole slew of considerations that come with being arrested. If you are in a team and you are recording this and you are able to set the camera down somewhere and continue recording and step away, that would also be great. Um, and if you are threatened in any way, that's all on camera then. Nora, I'm going to jump in, Victoria. Uh, so I think we're probably going to take another maybe 10, 12 minutes of questions. But Nora, the question I keep seeing over and over again are for folks are asking, if I am a foreign correspondent, but I'm reporting in the United States, do any of the rights that you've been talking about apply to me? Oh, wonderful. I haven't even seen that yet. So <laughs> thank you, Victoria. Um, Yes, they do. They apply to you. What's wonderful is the Constitution protects everyone who is in the United States. And um, it may be harder, there may be other considerations if you were ever to mount a kind of complaint or a legal action against agents who um, are here in the US and you are, let's say, foreign. But absolutely, the First Amendment protects you and it applies to you, as does the Fourth. So everything here today applies. And I want you to feel really comfortable with that. All right, let's see. Um, I understand that I can be arrested for obstructing traffic. What if the protest I am covering is spontaneous and occupying the street? Um, well, if there is no traffic, technically you are not obstructing traffic. Um, if a protest is in the middle of a street, and this has happened before, um, what happens with officers is often they will leapfrog in front of protests to try to move the direction of a protest. Even if it's spontaneous, let's say. A protest starts and blocks a big avenue. And then as people are going, what police may do is they can sometimes segment off different streets. So essentially a protest has to turn a certain direction. I have um, seen cases, legal cases, in which courts recognize that that tactic leapfrogging to somehow, you know, uh, reduce a protest or to determine its direction cannot then be coupled with calls for people to be arrested if they're obstructing traffic. Um, because it's antithetical. It's literally impossible if they are obstruct, if they're creating a pathway for protests to happen, and they're in the middle of them saying you're blocking traffic, that's literally impossible. If something is spontaneous though, and it's just a single street that is being blocked, I would say you are within your rights to be covering that, absolutely. I would stay on the sidewalk if you can, because sidewalks are public forums. And so if there is this walkway in the middle of a public roadway where people are walking, whether it's a highway or a big street, stay on the sidewalk if you can and cover it from there. If you can't, and there are no cars, I would absolutely memorialize that with either your recording or your reporting to be able to then later document when there are arrests because the most common arrests that happen are traffic related and then other disorderly conduct. Um, these are, I go back to what I said earlier, they're rather dirty tactics that officers use to reduce protest size. Um, and so if you are in the street, it is technically a viable criminal charge to say that you are obstructing a public roadway. Um, and I would be very cautious about where you stand in those instances. 
at the same time, there may be ways that officers are willing to work with press for press areas, keeping in mind that sometimes that can just be proxy to limit your coverage. No, it's me again. I'm just trying to be fair because I was watching the questions as they came in. Um, can you look at, I don't want to name people's names, but if you start with uh, right before, let's see, I think it's, well, I'll just read the question. Uh, how does what you've shared with us apply if on private property? So private university, a company's property, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, sure. If you are on private property, um, your rights are limited because it is not a public forum, right? Um, if you wanna think from a First Amendment perspective, public forums are spaces that the government has literally said, we open this up for civilians and for people to be able to express themselves because that's protected. Well, if someone else owns property, that's private property, um, there are a few things that can happen. One is often private property owners may actually endorse or say that they are fine with activity occurring. It's very rare, but it may happen, in which case you're okay. But it really depends on what the statements are and whether it's an endorsement or an order from private property owners that action and conduct not occur on their property. Um, and so it's really up to the owner, frankly, for whatever that property activity is occurring. Um, and so if it's, let's say, in a building or in um, a shop, it is up to the discretion of the owner to decide whether that conduct continue or it be seen as trespass because it is trespass if you do not have permission to be on that pri private property. Um, what about taking photos of protesters? Do we need to protect their faces or ask for consent? Well, some of this is really kind of the hallmarks of journalism and um, you know, protesters in many ways love getting photographed. They love being interviewed sometimes. I also am incredibly, incredibly sensitive to what we've been seeing lately where protesters are now being, and their faces are being surveyed um, through, let's see, even DEA has been monitoring and conducting surveillance of mass protest scenes. Part of why protesters typically pre-COVID wear masks is to actually try to prevent officers from identifying them. And so if you are photographing or filming from at least a far away large view and people are in public view far away, I would say that's okay. If you are though photographing someone up close, I absolutely think that needs to have consent from the subject of the photograph or the video. You can record image, you know, you can take photographs and you can take video. Um, those are sort of protected First Amendment activities. Audio is different though. And so I know the question was about photographs, but different states have different laws about audio and uh, getting consent from people who are, whose audio is being taken. So I would just be really careful that you're always when possible getting consent from everyone that you're able to see. Again, if it's something where you are covering from very far away, that is an unreasonable then request that every single person has the consent. Um, but generally, it's, it's a best practice to be able to get their consent. Let's see. I was covering a protest in Mexico. Um, yes, I'm going to jump in real quick. Um, there is a question that I wanted to flag for you, because I think this has come up also several times. What should reporters do if they're assaulted or attacked by an officer who's dis obscured their badge number or name? How can they get that info? Mm -hmm. um, there's been quite a bit of this in the recent protests. Um, and I know that it's going to be moving forward in litigation, this very question, but officers should not be obscuring their badge numbers or their names um, in no uncertain terms. And so if you find yourself, and this is part of the uncomfortable aspects of giving legal advice or counsel is that I still would put your physical safety first. And if an officer refuses to give their badge number or their name, I would not escalate that encounter. I would, as much as you can, memorialize it. Um, I would also then file a police uh, complaint with the whatever the internal affairs or police accountability board is. A lot of cities have these. And this is absolutely necessary to be able to track what those officers are, because most of the time what we've been seeing is that chiefs will then condemn actions on the part of officers that do obstruct their name and their badge number. Um, someone asked, does the police need to give a certain amount of time after releasing a curfew before enforcing it? 
Well, I would, one, just flag that media should be exempt from this. And I mentioned earlier, but I'll just quickly say again that we've been working with governors to notify them of local jurisdictions in their states that are non-compliant, where curfews are not exempting reporters. So if you are a reporter um, and you are conducting an essential service, which is news gathering, you do not have to then comply with that curfew. If you are non-essential in some way or not part of the media, um, there are reasonable steps where an officer must allow you to go home. So if you do have to talk with an officer and you're not media or your local curfew is non-compliant by not exempting media, I would absolutely make clear to officers that might stop you that you are walking home. Or if you are doing some essential service to try to make that argument, to say that you are news gathering. Of course, there is the discretion of every officer to choose what to do with that. And unfortunately, I would not feel confident in saying you have every right to go do that and they should listen because even if, when you have the right, they may decide to take some other punitive action. Victoria, have you seen any others that are really on repeat or that I need to answer? Because I want, I know we're coming up on time. I am seeing a debate towards the bottom of the chat that uh, I'm just going to draw your attention to. <laughs> mm. Nikki, um, sorry to strongly disagree on the question of consent. Um, if that were true, then would one have to get consent from a police officer photographed or recorded? For both audio and video in public, where there is no reasonable expectation of privacy, no consent is needed. Um, I mean, I think that's a great point. And I would just flag then uh, to clarify that if you are recording police, that is absolutely protected under the First Amendment. If you are individually photographing a single protester, that is where I would say, um, it's worth trying to get their consent for that photograph. If you have had an exchange with them, um, but in public, in these large protest settings, there is no expectation of privacy. The problem in my opinion is then that the use of footage often by government agencies is being used to monitor specific protesters. And so I bring your attention to that trend right now because it implicates really serious privacy questions. And I think we're still in the middle of that debate. We are looking at what are the boundaries around what governments can do in monitoring protesters and monitoring in this narrow context, protesters engaging in protected speech. But I appreciate the comment. No, I think maybe this will be the last one. I, I think I've, I've seen several questions, maybe one or two about, do we know if there's any litigation that has already uh, been launched across the country or that's in the works from us or other organizations um, on uh, violations of press freedom that, at the hands of police? Frankly, there are numerous lawsuits right now. And because of time, I can't go through all of them. Um, the most recent ruling that I think I'm aware of is in um, the ACLU of Minnesota and others filed a lawsuit about the use of tear gas against journalists. And the judge in that case on Tuesday issued an initial ruling unwilling to rule in favor of uh, against tear gas being used, but was incredibly critical in the ruling, the initial ruling that uh, the tactics used by police are deeply troubling. And so that's just one case. We've then seen many others. We are, uh, there is another class action brought by the National ACLU on behalf of reporters. Um, and frankly, because of time, I would just say I can't list all of them. But I know Victoria has put our emails in the chat and I am happy to answer emails that way or be in touch if you have an incident you're willing to talk about. Um, and I thank you so much for your time. So folks, I'm gonna jump in. I'm gonna give Nora, I wish we could give her a round of applause, but um, maybe we can wave at her through the chat. Nora, thank you so much. Uh, I know what a star you are, but that was really terrific. I also wanna thank all of you, not only for coming, but for all of you who are out there documenting what is happening. Thank you so much. We at Penn and all of the other organizations involved in this are here for you. Reach out to us if you need us. Um, and please do um, join our physical safety webinar tomorrow at 11. We have some of the leading experts in security in the world 
coming. And a uh, digital safety webinar, which I'll be co-running with the Freedom of the Press Foundation on keeping your cell phone safe if it gets confiscated, keeping your social media accounts safer. Uh, Thursday, next Thursday, is the mental health and uh, trauma uh, sort of focused webinar. And we can do more if you tell us what you need. So thank you all again and take care of yourselves. And I will send um, a follow-up email probably end of day or tomorrow uh, with a recording and with a whole bunch of resources that we've been compiling and the names of some of the other organizations that can also help you. So take care of yourselves and, and be as safe as you can out there.